And there we go. Okay. Ha, ha, howdy. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? It's Kyle from the podcast. And we are going to go over the films that I watched for the first time in the month of April. Now, with this specific month, it's going to be a bit of a shorter video, just because I didn't watch as many movies in the month of April. Out of the nine different things I watched, one of them was a television show, and the other one was a short film, so really it's technically seven feature-length movies. But all that to say is that we're going to make the best of it. Golly gosh. Garsh. Gee golly. And to start this video off, we are going to discuss Brian and Charles the short film version of the feature length film that came after this and uh, this was also directed by Jim Archer also has to do with the Brian and Charles characters that are portrayed by the same actors that you see in the feature and is essentially the same story just kind of boiled down to 12 minutes instead of 90 minutes obviously with this one there's a lot less going on there's a lot less characters and there's a lot less room for character development to take place but all that to say is that this thing isn't completely devoid of any sort of character development. With the short film version specifically, the character of Brian is a little bit rough around the edges compared to the feature film. In the feature length movie, they make him a lot softer of a character and they make him a little bit more human and relatable. Whereas in this one, they kind of doubled down on the sort of quirky, doesn't really interact with anybody else aspect of the character. You can tell that this version of Brian is a lot more hardened because he doesn't interact with a whole lot of people, hence the need to make a robot friend, you know, in, in Charles. I feel like this film, specifically the short version of it, was made as sort of a pre-concept for the feature film. It feels like they kind of just used this as practice for when they made the actual film itself. And the reason I say that is because the characters aren't really fleshed out. The sort of conflict that happens in the movie is literally just the fact that Brian gets sick of Charles and leaves him somewhere and then he feels bad and then comes and gets him. Like that's basically the entire short film version of the movie. And there's not much to it at all. You can also tell that a lot of the technical aspects aren't quite there yet. It just seems like they're shooting from the hip as far as what the movie is going to look like and what they want it to look like. Just a lot of amateur camera work and some sloppy framing here and there. All that to say that this isn't a bad movie by any means, this short film version. It's just you can very obviously tell that this is just supposed to be kind of a precursor to Brian and Charles, the feature film. I think the director, Jim Archer, sort of saw this as kind of a practice run for what they could possibly do with the concept fully fleshed out, and that's kind of how I view it as well. So Brian and Charles, the short film version, is a 6 out of 10. Next up is Cobain, Montage of Heck, directed by Brett Morgan. If you don't know who Brett Morgan is, he is the guy who also made Moon Age Daydream, which is the documentary about David Bowie and you can tell that this guy just kind of has a good experience with doing these sorts of documentaries around these musicians because I hear nothing but good things about Moon Age Daydream so there's got to be some level of competency there and when it comes to Montage of Heck I really do like how cohesive and well put together overall this documentary is. I'm a fan of the fact that it doesn't really have a whole lot in the way of the normal sort of talking head setup of people that knew Kurt Cobain or were around Kurt Cobain getting to talk about him and his life and their experiences with him and blah blah blah. You get a little bit of that but it's pretty few and far between. For the most part with this documentary, it's a kind of behind the scenes look at what his life was from birth up until he commits suicide. And it's pretty raw in the footage that they show you and the sort of journal entries that he makes in the different sorts of scattered diaries and journals and notes that he writes over the years. And it's pretty compelling to see that all kind of play out from conception to 
death, essentially. And that's pretty much what this movie is, is just one big montage of Kurt Cobain's life. A big complaint that I have with this is it can oftentimes feel pretty repetitive with the way that it's edited and the way it's presenting this sort of material to you. It does its best to kind of fit itself amongst the sort of grungy, kind of grimy aspect that Nirvana was known for at the time, and so there's a lot of heavy editing and kind of screamo and like animation sketches that are thrown in there that are supposed to be kind of grotesque, and I think a lot of it is from what Kurt Cobain actually doodled and wrote down in his journals. But at the same time, the way that they're presented just feels a little too long and a little too samey after a while. You kind of have to ask yourself like, okay, is there, are we going to get to another point in the documentary that keeps this interesting and fresh, or is it just going to keep hammering home with this sort of thing for a little bit too long of a time, and it kind of tends to do the latter just a little bit too much for me. Also, the inclusion of some talking heads, like they include interviews from Courtney Love and Chris Navaljak, I think it, that's how you pronounce his name, if I'm wrong about that, forgive me, and like Kurt Cobain's dad and his mom and everything, like they include his parents as well. A few of those can feel pretty documentary safe and it kind of does take away a little bit from the kind of rolling go with the flow nature of the documentary itself and what it wanted to accomplish and as far as that goes i'm not a huge fan of that but overall it's a pretty solid documentary if you want to learn more about kurt cobain or you're a fan of nirvana or you're just interested in how his life played out i think that this is a pretty essential documentary to check out so with this one i gave it a 7 out of 10 um, definitely closer to an 8 than it is a 6. I think if you are interested in Nirvana in any way, even surface level, I think that it is pretty entertaining and has something to offer. Next up is the Super Mario Brothers movie that came out this past year, directed by Michael Jelinek and Aaron Horvath, and has Chris Pratt as Mario, Charlie Day as Luigi, Anya Taylor-Joy as Peach, yada yada yada. You kind of get the gist of it. And revolves around Mario and Luigi in the Mushroom Kingdom and the antics that they get up to and Bowser's there and it's a hoot and a holler. So we talked about this on the podcast and hopefully I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this, but I feel like that might not be the case just given how I feel about this movie. I am a huge fan of Mario. I have grown up with Mario. It is the game series that I have consistently played for the last... 25 years and I've been a fan of the franchise for a very long time and not just like a surface level fan like I'm I'm really into Mario almost a little too much some could say and so when this movie was announced and they announced the cast and they announced the day I was looking forward to seeing it but I was also kind of hesitant and cautiously optimistic about what this movie could be especially since it was being made by Illumination which you know, if you're unaware, they don't have the best track record in Hollywood when it comes to animated films. They made Minions, they made Secret Life of Pets, they made Sing, and a whole bunch of other shit. But Shigeru Miyamoto was a producer on this film, and he worked very heavily with, I think it was the Illumination uh, like main producer of the film whose name I can't remember right now. If I figure it out, I'll pop it on screen. But knowing that Shigeru was heavily involved, I thought to myself, okay, so there's some potential for this movie to be at the very least decent. You know, at the very least, it's going to feel and look like Mario, whether or not the actual subtext or the content of the film would reflect that. And yeah, I think it's safe to say that it is all right. First and foremost, the positives. I think that they absolutely nail the tone and the atmosphere of what the world of Mario is without putting a specific game or a specific title on the movie to reflect the world of Mario because they easily could have just gone with Super Mario Brothers or just gone with Super Mario World or Super Mario 64, Super Mario Odyssey. They could have easily just slapped one game title to sort of represent what the movie is about, and they do a really good job of encompassing the whole universe without making it feel like one specific game. I do like the fact that they do that. I also thought Jack Black as Bowser was pretty killer. I think that he is far and above the best performance 
as far as voice acting in the movie. And I didn't hate Chris Pratt as much as I thought I might. He definitely still sounded like Chris Pratt for most of the film. There were very few and far between moments where he actually sounded like he was playing a character instead of just himself. But it wasn't distracting to the point where it ruined the movie for me. And I do really like Charlie Day as Luigi. I think that that was a really good fit as well. A lot of what people are complaining about this film is that it doesn't have a whole lot of plot going on, which I think for a film like this, when it revolves around Mario, you don't necessarily need a complicated plot or something along the lines of a multi-layered story going on if the characters are compelling enough and if there's something else there to kind of substitute for that and that's really where my complaints start is the characters a lot of people who really love this film will say oh it's a mario movie did you expect there to be a whole lot of in the way of plot in the way of like actual story going on because the games are just oh Bowser kidnaps Peach, and Mario has to go save Peach, and then he goes and saves her. The end. Were you expecting more than that? And to me, it's not that I was expecting, you know, a Charlie Kaufman level story or anything, or like a Robert Eggers type of narrative. That's not what I was expecting at all. What I was hoping for was for something else to kind of take the place of that and elevate the movie on a level in which I can't get the same experience with the video games. I was hoping that the characters would be a little bit better written, that they would have more depth, there would be a little more under the surface for us to glean from the characters and the relationships that they have with each other, but sadly you don't really get that in this film. It's just surface level joke after surface level joke after surface level line after surface level joke. And a lot of the jokes are just not really funny at all. If I'm going to watch a movie about one of my favorite video game franchises, I don't necessarily want to get the same exact experience watching that movie as I do playing the games because then I could just stay at home and play the video game instead of watch the movie. When I go and watch a movie, I want a different experience out of that and I want to get something out of it that I wouldn't have gotten before. So you don't need a whole complicated story in order to accomplish that. What I would have liked is some depth for the characters and something for me to grab onto and care about so that the story could have a little bit more of an impact in that regard. But unfortunately, this movie just isn't concerned with that. So that is just something that I see as a pretty big negative, in my opinion. Another thing I didn't like about this movie was the inclusion of licensed music. The inclusion of those songs, for the most part, was just really bad. Like when ACDC started playing in the Mario Kart section, I think I just audibly sighed because of how cliched it was. Take on me, back Backstreet Boys, not Backstreet Boys, Beastie Boys, forgive me. All the licensed music that's included in this movie is just so ill-fitting and I don't like that they included those in place of an original score, which apparently was being worked on and was supposed to be included in the movie, and that the songs were just placeholders for what Koji Kondo was supposed to conjure up. But instead, Illumination decided, Oof. Ooh, fuck it. We'll, we'll put ACDC in it. <laughs> yeah, it's just stupid and garbage, and I, I, I hate it. I just absolutely hate it. Another thing, too, is that while a decent amount of the voice acting is good, there was one that was distractingly bad, and that was Fred Armisen as Cranky Kong. I don't know what they were doing when they decided that instead of being a sort of cranky older man, uh, that was supposed to be kind of an elderly figure for Donkey Kong. They decided to make him this like pissed off middle-aged guy Like I don't know what that deal was. I don't know what he was channeling there, but it just sounded so awful It was distractingly bad and I think that might be one of the worst voice acting performances I have experienced in anything Maybe not anything, maybe that's being a little harsh, but definitely in a big budget film like this. And I, I wasn't a huge fan of Seth Rogen either. You know, he was okay up until he threw in the <laughs> twice. He, he does the Seth Rogen laugh two times and it's, uh, yeah. One thing I wanna end on with this film, and I, I definitely talked about this specific one 
longer than the others, so I apologize, but I just have a lot to say about it, is that there's this weird sentiment with movies sometimes when they come out where there'll be this audience versus critic mentality where the audience gets really defensive about the critical reception of this film and they'll point to different things to kind of show themselves in a better light and to kind of gain points for their side weirdly like oh the movie made a billion dollars so therefore it's good and that is not the case at all obviously especially when you think about movies like avatar way of water and this one and i also love the kind of hypocrisy that goes with it where audiences will say don't listen to the critics guys i don't care what the critics say i love this movie all right cool but the fact that you said that you don't care what the critics say and are very vocal about it kind of makes me think that you care a little bit about what the critics say Huh? There's also people that'll say, oh, it's just a kid's movie, it's not that deep, you kind of have to give it a pass because it's a movie for kids. And I disagree with that. Take a look at Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, which is a movie that I think I talked about in the last video. That is a movie with great writing, great characters, emotional depth, and it's got a great sense of humor to go along with it. And it's something that both adults and kids can enjoy because it's just a well-done film. With this one, it's got good aspects to it, but the fact that a movie kind of babies itself and the fact that people say, oh, it's for babies, so you have to give it a pass, I don't agree with at all. I think that you should be able to make a good film that encompasses all sorts of different audience range and age and whatever without having to sacrifice the quality of that film. It's absolutely possible and we've seen it possible many many times but for some reason that's a criticism that people fall back on to kind of give this movie a pass and I just can't do that. I'm sorry. So to wrap this up the Super Mario Brothers movie is a 6 out of 10. Definitely want to like it more. I wish that there were things about it that were better done, creative choices that would have been a little more impactful and a little bit higher in quality, but overall not the worst thing. Definitely not bad by any means, but it could have been a lot better. Next up is Reign of Fire, directed by Rob Bowman, and this is a, I think, 2002 film has Christian Bale and Matthew McConaughey and they fight dragons in modern times. Modern times. Because this movie came out like almost 20 years ago. This is a film that definitely has a consistent sense of style going for it that I do appreciate. And the fact that they managed to get Christian Bale and Matthew McConaughey in this very fucking schlocky movie is just impressive to me on its own. One thing I do like about this is that it does kind of feel like there's a level of self-awareness to it in just how kind of stupid and cheesy the concept is. And for a few moments throughout this movie, it sort of embraces it. You've got moments where characters are flying through the air kind of anime style and like the dragons are flying around them and eating people up and you've got christian bale taking dragons down by a turret and matthew mcconaughey jumps off a building with an axe and it's fucking cool as shit you've got a decent amount of those moments but then you've also got really kind of dumb moments of dialogue in between where characters just act stupid and irrational for no reason like there's a character that's supposed to be christian bale's like kind of son but he like raised him from infancy but he's not really his dad but he's like been taking care of him this whole time and the son character basically says i don't like what you're doing as a leader i'm gonna go with matthew mcconaughey and then he like leaves for like a hot minute and then he comes back and he's like i'm sorry dad i shouldn't have left and he's like it's okay son come here i'm christian bale i'll give you a hug like it's just it's it's kind of funny to me but it, it definitely makes it not as self-aware as sometimes I think it is. There's some special effects that look okay, but for the most part, this movie is dated as fuck. And the ending of this film, I'm not gonna give anything away, but it is very abrupt. It almost kind of feels like one of those movies where it has a rising action, a climax, and then bleep, a little bit after, and then the end of the movie. It's very sudden and abrupt, and it just left me going, that was it. So yeah, Reign of Fire, 5 out of 10. 
very kind of middling film in terms of quality but it is a goofy fun time and i think that if you're looking for a film to kind of have fun with your buddies this is a pretty good choice to go with glenn gary glenn ross was a film directed by james foley it stars kevin spacey al pacino alec baldwin for like a hot second ed harris and a few others alan arkin rest in peace and is essentially based off of a play about salesmen that are trying to get the leads and the person who sells the least amount gets fired. This movie is essentially an actor's playground. It is very encompassing of heavy dialogue scenes and scenes where actors are just having these long, long monologues with each other back and forth just over and over. And it's compelling because these characters are very interesting and they're very diverse and there's a good dynamic to it and it feels like a lot of the lines and the line delivery just flows really well and i think it does give it that sort of play feel and it does help that this is based off of stage play the performances are really compelling uh you know fucking say what you will about kevin spacey but the man can act the man can act he's a fucking creep but he can act al pacino's great his character is very compelling ed harris is very interesting and I do kind of like the swanky, kind of almost jazz music that's played throughout this film. It's almost kind of like you're in the back alley of a jazz club and you're sort of listening to people's in-depth conversations that they have with each other. I really do love the set designs too because it feels like the spaces that they choose are very lived in, especially when they go back to the office environment later in the film. And there's just like papers and folders and like desks are very array and like chairs everywhere. and. Everything just feels very unkempt and messy, but it sets the scene very well in terms of where the characters are at and where the story's at and the relation to those things with the set. And I think it all comes together very well. One thing about this film is that it could be a little bit repetitive uh, if you're someone who's not really a fan of these types of films. It did get that way a little bit for me. Uh, you know a few times in this movie and it's not like the camera work is anything super special uh, the cinematography is fine but it's not gonna blow you away it's very straightforward a lot of shot reverse shot stuff there's some like swooping camera angles that are kind of cool with like scenes in the in the bar or like scenes in the office where characters come to a realization about something or they have an interaction that calls for that sort of camera work I think that that's pretty cool but otherwise the visual aspects and the technical aspects overall just aren't super impressive. So Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, I gave an 8 out of 10. Really good movie. I suggest it if you're a fan of characters having really good dialogue with each other in a movie. And this one is definitely one to think about in terms of that. Next up is A Ghost Story, directed by David Lowry. And David Lowry directed The Green Knight, which came out a few years ago. And I remember seeing The Green Knight, and I wasn't the biggest fan of it was kind of disappointed in it and whenever i think of a movie that i was disappointed in when i saw it it's usually the green knight so i was curious about ghost story which is the movie that he made before the green knight and i kind of knew a little bit of what it was but i didn't know how it would play out or the way it was filmed or just the overall story beats that it was going for and I really dig this movie. It's a very simple plot. Essentially you're watching this ghost of Casey Affleck who's covered in like a sheet blanket roam around his house after he's died and he kind of gets to see the life that his wife lives and uh, a little bit beyond, I will say, without giving too much away. I really do think that the strongest thing that this movie has going for it is the tone and the cinematography. I think that both work very well with each other. And David Lowry knows what he's doing behind the camera when it comes to the visuals of his film and what he wants to get across. Despite what I said about The Green Knight being a disappointment, there are still shots in that movie that I can clearly picture in my head because it made me go, oh wow, that's really cool. I really like the way he filmed that. And it's pretty much the same case with this movie too. While the plot is very simple and straightforward, there's nothing too complicated going on, it does leave you with some themes to kind of chew on and think about. And 
It's integrated pretty well in this story, I would say. I like the music choices, or sometimes the lack thereof music choices. Sometimes when you omit music in a scene, it makes it a little bit more effective, and I think that this is definitely the case with this film, specifically. There's some moments where they feel a little too long, and it feels like the movie kind of drags a bit in parts. I'm thinking of specifically the part where we just kind of sit and watch Rooney Mara eating a pie. And I get what the director was going for with scenes like that, where you're really just intimately involved with this person's day-to-day -day life now, and this is basically what you would have to sit through if you were in a position like this. But at the same time, I don't know if we as the audience need 10 whole minutes of that. I think maybe a little bit less time spent on that sort of thing would have been just as effective, if not a little bit more cohesive with the way the film was structured. But overall, I enjoy this film, and I think that if you're a fan of really great cinematography in movies, which you should be, why wouldn't you be? That's stupid. And a movie with a great tone and an amazing atmosphere, I think you're really going to like this one. And A Ghost Story, for me, is an 8 out of 10. Uh, definitely closer to a 9 than a 7. Uh, if I ever check it out again, it might go up, but for right now, I'm comfortable with an 8. Next up is a film that I have seen before, but it's one that I hadn't seen in a long time, and given us talking about the Super Mario Brothers movie, I figured it was appropriate to include this, and plus the video would be a lot shorter if I didn't, so I'm gonna include it anyway. Super Mario Brothers live action 1993 with Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo, directed by Annabelle Jenkel and Rocky Morton, and this is basically Blade Runner for kids. It is very tone deaf in the way it handles the Mario property and very much does not feel like Mario in the slightest. The closest that you get is when about 70% through the film they finally get their red and green jumpsuits. It's not like they're in overalls though, they're just in like these weird like jumpsuit type things with like the boots that help them jump up fast or far or whatever the fuck. I'm entirely convinced that if this movie wasn't so heavily reliant on using Super Mario Brothers in its title and the characters for their names, I think that this would have been a lot better of a movie. If this wasn't Mario at all and it was just its own thing and it was sort of this like dystopian kind of lizard environment where people evolved from lizards instead of apes and that, that, that you know that's the concept of the movie it's kind of bonkers then I think it would have worked a lot better if it didn't try to include those elements of Mario in it because you can tell that the directors and whoever else was involved in making this movie was not fucking concerned at all about including Mario in there for people to watch to enjoy Mario in a movie. This film is very messy, it's structured very poorly, and it's got a lot going on that feels like it really doesn't matter and it kind of just very messily flails through the story in this movie. All that being said, there are things about it that I do appreciate a little bit more now that I'm older and I can view it with a bit more of an objective lens. For example, I really do like the fact that John Leguizamo and Bob Hoskins seem to have really good chemistry with each other, despite the fact that John Leguizamo looks like he could be Bob Hoskins' son rather than brothers, I think that their chemistry is one of the best parts of this movie, and I think that they have a really good way of bouncing off of each other, despite how shitty this movie was. And I guess that they would get drunk a lot of the times when they were filming this movie, and if it helped their chemistry, then fuck it, why not? Who cares? It's a trash fire movie anyway. I also really do like the set designs, and I think that, if anything, they're impressive in the way that they're put together and constructed, and it really gives you a good sense of the world that they're in, even if the world doesn't necessarily match Mario at all. With all that being said, Super Mario Bros. is a 4 out of 10. I think I bumped it up from what I had it at just because I do have to think about some of the better aspects of it when it comes to this movie, but overall, it's still not good, and I think that if you're looking for something more akin to a Mario feel, definitely check out the newer film in comparison, or you know, just play the games, 
because they're fucking great. Next up is Bo's Afraid, directed by Ari Aster, starring Joaquin Phoenix, and is a three hour long odyssey about Joaquin Phoenix going to see his mother. And that's all you need to know. This movie, I was kind of mixed on when I first saw it because it has a lot of different things going on in terms of surrealism and ambiguity and what's reality, what isn't reality, and just the type of character that Bo is portrayed by Joaquin Phoenix. First and foremost, I think that the performances are spot on. I think that everyone is very well cast and all the actors do what they need to do, especially Joaquin Phoenix, who really feels like he puts everything into this role specifically. Like, he's damn good, and he's one of my favorite actors for a reason, because he absolutely could pull pretty much anything off, I think. It's also nice to see Nathan Lane in a movie again, and it was cool seeing him in that section of the film, you know, with the couple sort of towards the second act of the movie. And of course this film is shot really well and it's very visually compelling and it sort of encompasses a few different styles here and there, but for the most part it's pretty consistently clean looking and I really like how this movie turned out visually. One thing I will say is that this movie is its strongest when it first starts out and it's kind of revolving around him in his apartment area and in the city block that he lives in and just sort of dealing with all the chaos around him there and from there the movie does kind of get gradually weaker as it goes on because then you start to delve into the more surreal aspects of the film kind of asking yourself what's more real what's not real and i think a lot of it isn't really pulled off all that well to kind of give you that level of tension when it comes to a surreal movie like this when you have something that's surreal i think it's important to set up the kind of stakes that you want the audience to feel in order for the movie to be as effective as it wants it to be. For example, I'm thinking of ending things gradually sets up these things throughout the entire movie to give you the sense that not everything is as it seems and then towards the end of the film it justifies itself because it has one big underlying meaning behind it and is backed up by things that took place in the film before. Whereas this movie, Bo is Afraid, it doesn't really feel like it has that justification to dip its toe into the more surreal elements of this film. I think it kind of struggles with finding its own identity at points and figuring out what exactly it wants to be. I do enjoy a lot of the more fantastical elements of it and I think that it pulls off a lot of those things very well on a technical level on an emotional level when I was watching this in the theater and experiencing these things it was pretty effective in the moment but just kind of thinking back on it and especially thinking about how this film ends I'm very conflicted on it and I think that's kind of what Ari Aster wanted out of me but at the same time I don't know how effective that was in terms of my enjoyment of the film overall. As far as the runtime, I didn't think that it was too long. A lot of people think that this movie overstays its welcome, and I don't think I'm one of those people. I really do like the runtime of this film, and the pacing feels like it's right where it needs to be at for me. So wrapping this up, Bo is Afraid, I'm going to give an 8 out of 10. I really enjoy this film. I think I enjoyed it more than Midsommar, but definitely not as good as Hereditary. And... I would definitely watch this again, but I need to give it some time because it is a commitment and it is a lot to chew on. So if you enjoy the surreal, you enjoy the kind of horror comedy aspects that it promises you, then I think that you're going to enjoy this film. And especially if you like Ari Aster overall anyway. Last one I want to talk about is a TV show that I enjoyed watching, which is The Beef. The Beef? No, it's just Beef. Sorry, I'm thinking of... I was thinking of the bear, and in the show The Bear, the restaurant is called The Beef, and now I'm just talking about Beef, which is another TV show. Ooh, excuse me. Anyway, Beef with Steven Yun and Ali Wong, and it's essentially about two people who get in a road rage incident, and from there, their lives kind of spiral out of control and intertwine with each other throughout the remainder of the show. First of all, I think the acting is one of the best things about this. I think they absolutely nail the casting and Steven Yeun and Ali Wong knock it out of the park. I think that they are far and beyond the best parts of this entire thing and the whole show kind of hinges on their chemistry and the way that they act and the way that they portray their characters 
and you get to learn a lot about them just from their performances alone and i think that they do it in an amazing way one thing i also like is the inclusion of the music that they use so they use a lot of sort of early mid 2000s hits kind of late 90s stuff that kind of throws you back to a time when you were younger and times were simpler and it makes you reflect on who you are as a person now and the type of upbringing that you had to get you to this point and I think that the inclusion of those songs is very effective when you think about these characters because they're sort of supposed to be older millennial characters that are going through these different things in life. They're trying to adapt to the world around them at this current time. Like I said before, just kind of effectively showing you that these people are shaped because of the environment that they grew up in and the sort of nostalgia that comes with that. And I think that ultimately that's one of the things that this TV show is about and it encompasses a whole myriad of different themes and messages and things to chew on when it comes to thinking about this show overall. I really like the way that this is shot visually. I think it's very compelling and there are a lot of moments that are just really effective when it comes to engaging the audience with its content. All that being said, I think that there are some moments here and there that the story kind of slows itself down and you sort of lose a little bit of the momentum that's built up. For example, there's, you know, I guess it's not really a spoiler, but kind of, I guess, if you consider this within the definition of a spoiler for yourself, there's a bit of a time jump in the sort of later half of this limited series, and it kind of takes away a little bit of the momentum that you build up, but it does it for a reason, and it does a good job of building that momentum back up. Overall, I think that this show is great, and I would be excited to see any project from Hikari, which is the name of the person who I think created this, developed it, was the showrunner for it, directed a lot of the episodes. I would pretty much recommend this to most people who would enjoy a good television show to sort of binge and easily consume. And that's the nice thing too, is that this show, for the most part, the episodes are around 30 minutes. And I think the last one's like 45 minutes, but a good portion of the show is very bingeable, and I think that most people would enjoy it. So Beef, I gave a 9 out of 10. Great show. Check it out. It's awesome. I love Steven Young. I would kiss him if I could. And that is it for the April films of 2023 that I watched for the first time, even though Mario Brothers live action wasn't the first time technically, but I included it anyway just because I wanted to include a little bit more in this video because like I said the month of April was pretty short in terms of movie viewing for myself and I think that it doesn't really hurt to throw in some other movies that I have seen before in here from time to time especially since maybe some people are curious and you know it never hurts to give my thoughts on it anyway thank you guys for checking this out I appreciate it the May video will be out two weeks from now and that one will be a little bit longer because I watched more movies that month. Check out the podcast if you haven't already. Mac and I have a pretty good show going with each other. Our Barbenheimer episode recently came out, so we have a pretty meaty discussion about those films and our top five guys who are dudes. If you're curious what that means, check the episode out. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. That would be epic as shit. And let me know what you thought of this. If you like it, if you don't like it, if you want me to be punched in the face... Hopefully not, and until next time, I will see you guys later. Peace.